Welcome back Autobots and Decepticons to another episode of Fixing Transformers. And in today's we're going to take a look at the 10 Constructicons that form up in the Devastator. And this video will be the end all be all of my Constructicon saga that is spread over 4 different videos. With this one being a definitive version of everything you need to know about the mighty Devastator. So basically view this video as a Constructicon Misconceptions 2.0. So to start off, the Constructicons are a group of Decepticons that take the form of various construction vehicles. Many sharing alternate modes and body types. But when combining into Devastator there's only a core 10 of them that could do so. With Rampage and Demolisher filling in for Skipjack and Scavenger on extreme circumstances. But before we move on, we need to figure out when the Constructicons arrived on Earth. And well, in movie lore, they came down during the events between Transformers 2007 and Revenge of the Fallen, which takes place in 2009. And I theorize that they came down to Earth from an invitation message from Soundwave, similar to how Optimus called for all Autobots to come to Earth at the end of Transformers 2007. And if you remember, it was Soundwave's plan in the first place to revive Megatron, proven by the fact that he sent Ravage to retrieve the Allspark Shard at Nest in Diego Garth and later he would send the Constructicons perfectly on a collision course to Megatron's body to revive him. Along with him working with humans since the 1970s for his own greater Decepticon agenda, stated by a line that Dylan says in Dark of the Moon, You really think you're the first man ever asked to join the noble alien cause? Who are you? You know why we've not been back to the moon since 1972? Because these two, they came to my dad and they told him to do some creative accounting. They get way too expensive to ever go back, so he and others shut down the American and Russian space programs, and they've been our clients ever since. So with this information out of the way, we can now hammer down Soundwave being the sole perpetrator for the Constructicons that come to Earth. But now moving back onto the Constructicons, once they landed on Earth, they would find themselves ironically in a construction pit. Mixmaster would tell his crew to scan any vehicle that would accommodate them in size and style. And just like I said in my What If I Survive Devastator video, Mixmaster would become the head of Devastator with scan a Mac Granite GU-713 cement truck with the original Mac Dog becoming a Decepticon version, Long Ho will become the right leg of Devastator and also the foot, scans a green Caterpillar 773B dump truck, Payload who becomes a left leg scans a yellow Caterpillar 773B dump truck, Skipjack who becomes a left foot of Devastator scans a yellow Caterpillar M930 Bulldozer, Scrapper who becomes the right arm and hand scans a Caterpillar 992D front end loader, Scrap Metal who becomes the upper left arm scans a Volvo EC700C crawler excavator, with a Stanley UP45SV universal processor attachment, to lift up metal rods. Hightower becomes a left arm, scans a Kalepko CK2500 crawler crane. Buckethead who becomes a left hand, scans according to TF Wiki an unknown vehicle. But doing a lot of digging, I actually found out that he turns into a Caterpillar M930 bulldozer. Just like Skipjack, but then with a scooper shovel attachment instead of the traditional blade. Scavenger who becomes the upper body, scans a Red Trex O1K RH400 mining excavator. And lastly, Overload who becomes a lower body, scans a Red Caterpillar 776B belly dump haul truck. But before before I can tell you what these guys did in Revenge of the Fallen, there's two more Constructicons that I would like to cover, Demolisher and Rampage. Now despite popular belief, these guys are not Constructicon clones, but merely share the same body type as Skipjack and Scavenger. Now on a side note, we never did see their robot forms in Revenge of the Fallen, so you could say they have completely different robot forms entirely. Now though this belief is fun to think about, it's completely false, since if you look at the concept art, the Scavenger and Skipjack designs were recolored and reused to become Demolisher and Rampage. And it also works for their vehicle forms, since if you look at Rampage, he is a Caterpillar M930 bulldozer, but just instead he is red, with a bit of yellow in the hydraulic system. But for Demolisher, this is where things get tricky, since his vehicle mode is a white Turex RH400 mining excavator. Well, if you remember, Scavenger was an ONK RH400 mining excavator. And if you look at their names, they both have RH400 mining excavator in their titles. But if you notice, they are from two totally different companies. And in appearance, they're the exact same excavator. So how can this be? Well, to clear up all the confusion, here's a little history lesson. In 1933, the Euclid Company was founded by the Armington Brothers. Its success was in designing and building haul trucks, which would later attract the attention of General Motors. And they would buy the Euclid Company in 1953. Shortly after, GM would dominate the industry with their new brand. This would later get the attention of the US Department of Justice, and they gave an antitrust suit against GM, which is basically the anti-monopoly laws. And this is used when a company gets really big and no other company can really compete with them. So the government will break that company up into smaller pieces Pieces, so competition will have a chance to compete. Now this would force GM to stop manufacturing and selling construction trucks in the US for four years, and to divest parts of its Euclid business and the Euclid name. And this is where 
where Terex comes into play. In the 1970s, GM coined the name Terex, from the Latin words Terra, Earth, and Rex, King, for its construction equipment products and its trucks, which were not coverted by the ruling. The remaining parts of the Trex business produced crawlers, front-end loaders, and scrapers. Now in the early 80s, Trex fell on hard times during the recession. This forced General Motors to sell the Trex brand to IBH Holdings. But in 1983, due to the recession again, IBH would go bankrupt, and the ownership of Trex would go back to GM, where they would reorganize the brand and eventually sell it off to Northwest Engineering, where they would expand the Trex brand, nearly tripling the brand's size by 1989. Now throughout 1990 to 98, the Trex brand would acquire many brands, one of which would be O&K Mining in 1998, where they would later take their O&K RH400 mining excavator and rebrand it as their own Terex RH400 mining excavator, which would finally clear up the misconception on why Demolisher and Scavenger are the same vehicle but with different names. And just for fun, here's some extra history with Terex. Later in 2010, Terex divested its mining business by selling it to Bucyrus International. But before the RH400 would get its new design, Bucyrus the same year was bought by Caterpillar Incorporated, where five Finally, in 2011, they would rebrand the RH400 into the Caterpillar 6090. And now with all this history of Terex out of the way, we can finally move on to what the Constructicons did in Revenge of the Fallen. Sometime after the death of Megatron by the hands of Sandwood Wiki, Soundwave sent a message throughout the galaxy requesting all Decepticons amongst the stars that come to Earth, many of which would hear this call and oblige. Within all these Decepticons were a group called the Constructicons, a faction of artisans that could combine into Devastator, a powerhouse of destruction that could suck up anything in its path. Once all these Decepticons landed across the globe, they would scan any vehicle that they could find and hide in plain sight until further orders. Also during this time following the disbanding of Sector 7, the Non-Biological Extraterrestrial Species Treaty, NEST, was set up under William Lennox to create a combined human Autobot defense force against Decepticons. Under the Classified Alien Autobot Cooperation Act, which stated Autobots would share their intelligence and personnel with the US. Now from this point on up until the events of Revenge of the Fallen, NEST has been hunting down Decepticons for the past Past eight months, with Demolisher being the sixth enemy contact that they would engage. China's cover story in this one is toxic spilled. They had to evac the area for search and rescue. This makes six enemy contacts in eight months. We gotta make sure this one does not get out in the public eye, so keep it tight. Now Ness found out about Demolisher's whereabouts in Shanghai thanks to the Chinese government, telling them about a suspicious report of a mining excavator making its way around Shanghai, with his last known whereabouts being at an abandoned steel mill. With this info in mind, Nessa closed in on Demolisher's position with the help of Ironhide to take him out without the public knowing about it. But this would not go according to plan since when closing in on Demolisher, he would transform and smash the ground, sending many concrete pipes up into the air, hitting Ness soldiers left and right before rolling away. Now Demolisher made an escape plan to book it out of the city since he knew auto about forces were going to go after him, so he took the nearest highway to evacuate, while in the process of throw cars around him like toys smashing them at will. This forced Ness to call Optimus Prime to handle the situation, where he would beeline it towards Demolisher just as he was smashing an overpass to climb onto him. He would request Demolisher to pull over, but Demolisher didn't want to have any of that, so he kept on going, until Ironhide shot out his leg supports causing him to tumble off the freeway into a warehouse district, where he would lie hopelessly, while the two Autobots and the soldiers closed in. When asked for his last words, he warned the Autobots that Earth wasn't their planet to rule and that the Fallen shall rise again. Prime responded with not today, and then executed the Decepticon, leaving Ness to clean up his remains. After the battle was done, the Autobots went back to Ness HQ and Diego Garcia, and discussed the incident that went down, alongside talking about the location of Megatron's body and the Allspark fragment which was in storage. But little did they know that Soundwave was actually eavesdropping on this conversation by tapping into a satellite that was transmitting the conversation to the US military. With this new info about Megatron's location and the shard, Soundwave waited until nightfall to eject Ravage, who would retrieve the shard from the base. Soundwave would also contact the Constructicons aboard the Bayos Freightliner, which would sail over to Laurentian Abyss. Once receiving this transmission, Mixmaster took a small strike team consisting up of Long Haul Rampage and Scrap Metal to Seaport where they would load themselves onto the Bayos Freightliner, which would sail across the North Atlantic and over the Laurentian Abyss. And once they were above the drop zone, they waited for Ravage to arrive with the Shard. And once he would arrive, they would dismount the ship, going all the way down to Davy Jones' locker to reach Megatron. And once they found a the body, Scapple saw that it was beaten up and told the Constructicons to kill was a little one, to use his parts to fix Megatron. Once Scrap Metal was brutally taken apart, Scrapple slammed a shard into Megatron's chest, and his broken body combined with Scrap Metal's parts to grant Megatron a brand new body. But this spark energy would also spread around the area, causing Blackout, Bonecrusher, and Brawl to be revived, along with Scrap Metal since some of his parts were still lying around. Now if Megatron revived, he would leave the ocean and fly to the Nemesis, which is located on Enceladus, one of Saturn's many moons, to discuss the plan of the Fallen to activate a legendary Star Harvester, a machine that harvests Energon by 
destroying suns, and this will come into play later. But in the meantime, Mixmaster Strike Team would make their way from the Laurentian Abyss all the way to New York to wait for Megatron's next orders. These orders would be for any Decepticon around the world to make any mischief that they could in celebration of the Fallen's arrival. Mixmaster would take this into his own hands by climbing up the Brooklyn Bridge and smacking the American flag off. Also during the celebration, many Decepticons that left the Nemesis to join in on the action made a significant mess around the world, some of which being the destruction of Big Ben and the US aircraft carrier fleet. One such Decepticon would find Sam's parents and would later hand them over to Rampage for interrogation. Later when Megatron would order the Decepticons to go to Egypt, Mixmaster would tell his team to wait in a nearby quarry which was directly in front of the Great Pyramid of Giza, since underneath all that sandstone would be the Star Harvester. And once Megatron would give the order, the 10 Constructicons would form up into Devastator and start to make their way towards the Star Harvester. But now you may be wondering, where is Rampage during all this? Well if you remember that one Decepticon protoform got a hold of Sam's parents, and he would later give them over to Rampage once they were in Egypt, where Rampage would interrogate them to see if they knew anything about Sam's whereabouts. But he wouldn't get any useful information out of them since his parents did not have a clue. But Rampage would get his big break when Starscream would tell him the location of Sam. And luckily for him, Sam wasn't that far away. And once Starscream told him to spring the trap, he would eject Sam's parents to use him as bait and to close in on Sam's location, where he would interrogate him to get the Matrix of Leadership. But this would not go according to plan since Bumblebee was right around the corner and would take him out very quickly, saving Sam, Michaela, and the parents. But there's one thing to Rampage's character that every one is overlooked, and that would be for him not being the type of Decepticon to kill humans. Let me explain. As TFWiki states, Rampage led Sam with Wiki into a trap by holding his parents captive to use them as a trade-off for the Matrix of Leadership. This is also proven by the fact that Starscream says Rampage bring the trap, this trap referring to keeping the parents alive as bait. But if you break down this scene, I believe that there's more to it. Starting off of Sam's parents, the only harm that we see Rampage do to them is to eject them onto the sand. And if you look at Judy and Ron, they appear to be fine besides the fact that they are a bit dirty from the sand. Now you may ask why is this important? Well it is because it shows that Rampage did not have the intention to harm them whatsoever. And think about it like this, if you found your parents hostage and you had to trade off the Matrix of Leadership to get them, would it be more convincing if they were beaten up a bit or if they had no signs of harm? And I think if Sam's parents were presented as beaten up, Sam would have given the Matrix on the spot, even if he knew Bumblebee was around the corner. But you see, Rampage chose not to do that, and you could say the reason why he did no harm was because of Starscream's orders, but I would have to conclude this to be false, since when Starscream found Sam, he tried to grab him, and that grab does not seem like the one to hold you carefully, but the one to break a few bones in the process. And for more proof, in Dark of the Moon, Screamer was going to kill Carly and Sam with no hesitation whatsoever. So in movie continuity, he probably told Rampage to keep the parents alive in any condition that he chose. But also to prove that Rampage is not a human killer, all of his attacks are planned carefully, to scare Sam and a team, but without hurting them in any way. To capitalize more on this, let's break down all of his attacks. For one, if you look when he jumps and lands, he makes sure not to crush Sam by using his arms to catch himself, but in the process to confine him. He also shoots off a warning shot at Michaela. Now you could say if she hadn't ducked it would have hit her, but in reality this shot would have gone to the left, and even if she did stand still, she would have not been hit by it. And also when Rampage goes to smack down his whip, he does it close to Sam's parents, but he doesn't actually hit them. Now the reason why he does his attack is to visibly show Sam what will happen if he doesn't give over the Matrix. And this reoccurs in the second whip, right before Bumblebee jumps on. Him. And the reason why he even went for the second one was, since Sam was stalling with giving the Matrix, he would yet again remind him what would happen in the hopes of speeding him up. But I did leave out one piece of information, and that would be for Rampage speaking to Sam. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this. In his line, so what Wiki is not a throwaway line, but it's actually again another piece of his plot, of trading off the Matrix for his parents. So at the end of the day, I believe that we can conclude Rampage being a reasonable Decepticon. And it was a shame honestly to see him go because I believe if Sam would have given up the Matrix, Rampage would have left in peace. But now let's move back onto our friend Devastator and see what he's up to. And at this point in time, he would make his way up the pyramid to dig out the Star Harvester, with the help of his Vortex Grinder, an artificial black hole that can suck up nearby objects. Once these objects enter, they are at the point of no return, and they are broken down and shredded by extreme temperatures, and are later expelled from his back. But this digging in the sand wouldn't last long, since at this point, Simmons had made his way up the pyramid and would radio in a nearby navy ship to fire his experimental weapon, the railgun. The gun's projectile will hit Devastator causing him to lose his balance and to tumble down the pyramid, closing Devastator's story for the rest of the former Transformers cinematic universe. But this video is far from over, since I purposely have not covered a few things since I wanted to keep the misconceptions part of this video out of the story. So let's jump right back into Revenge of the Fallen and pick apart a few things with the constructor cons that need a little bit more explaining. The famous one being the scene on the Bayos Freightliner. In this shot we see Mixmaster Long haul Rampage and Scrapper, but when Ravage lands, Rampage gets switched to Skipjack and Scrapper to Scrap Metal. But then in the next scene, it's back to Mixmaster, Scrapper, Long haul and Rampage. 
So why does this happen? Well to clear this up in this shot, Scrapper should be replaced with Scrap Metal, since he was the one who was supposed to be ripped apart and not Scrapper. And this is proven when Scapel says kills a little one. Since if you look at the size chart, Scrapper is 29 feet, making him 7 feet taller than Mixmaster and Rampage. So in reality, Mixmaster or Rampage would have been considered the little one and should have been ripped apart. But to further push this point, Scrap Metal is the smallest Constructicon. Though we don't have a canon height for him, if we look at the Studio Series toy, he is clearly the smallest of the group. But the last nail in the coffin is Megatron's parts. Let me explain. Since Scrap Metal is a crane, he has treads. And when Megatron gets combined of Scrap Metal's parts, his legs get formatted to have treads. But let's say he would use Scrapper's parts. Scrapper doesn't have treads, but he has tires. So Megatron, in theory, would not have the treads that he has now, but tires, similar to how his legs look in Dark of the Moon. So in conclusion, considering if we accept Scrapper in the scene to be Scrap Metal, this whole identity crisis can be averted. And a real world reason why I believe this issue occurred was because since they filmed the scene twice, hence the two versions of the construction vehicles between shots, ILM simply just mixed up the designs, along with the fact that in some parts of the film they were rushing to get some of the CGI work done, and they just did not have enough time to create Scrap Metal's concept art into a CGI robot, so they would just use Scrapper's design as a placeholder. The next misconception I would like to cover is the Skipjack Rampage controversy. So if you kept up with my channel for a while, you probably have noticed I've called Rampage Skipjack in the past. And I've done this for two reasons. One is his name in the credits, and I'll get to that in a bit, and two, the Revenge of the Fallen Toys. So to start off, let's address who is who. The red robot who fights Bumblebee is Rampage, and the yellow bulldozer who makes up Devastator's foot is Skipjack. Now the name Skipjack originated from Rampage's original on-set name. This also would happen if Demolisher's name too, since his early working name was Wheelbot, which you can also see in the Revenge of the Fallen credits. But for when it was time to make the Revenge of the Fallen toys, Hasbro would step in and give them a proper name from the Transformers mythology. Skipjack would become Rampage, and Wheelbot would become Demolisher. But for when they made the toys of each of them, both of the Rampage redecos, the hard to get red version and the easy to find yellow version, were both titled Rampage, leading fans to conclude that both versions of the character were Rampage. This would also happen with Hasbro calling the scavenger toy Demolisher. But the name Skipjack doesn't end here, since Zakara saw this issue and decided to use the Skipjack name for the Rampage mold in their 2010 Easy Collection line. The next misconception I would like to cover is where does Scrap Metal combine onto Devastator? And ever since the studio series Devastator was revealed, Many people were confused since on that toy, Scrap Metal takes Buckethead's spot to form the hand. But as we saw in the film, this is not the case. First of all, we can see Scrap Metal in the combination scene right here. So we know right off the bat that he combines with Hightower. And that's for two reasons. First of which, in the shot, we can see a lot of yellow parts behind Hightower. And these parts would end up forming the shoulder of Devastator. But now you may be saying trance. There's no parts that indicate that they came from Scrap Metal. Well, you are partly right since some of these mess of parts did come from Hightower. But the others came from Scrap Metal. Since if you look at this shot of Devastator's upper left arm, what do you see? Well, treads, of course. And those treads definitely look like they came right off of Scrap Metal. And if you want to have an in-film shot of the treads, you can see them in this clip. Another misconception would be, where does Payload form up on Devastator? Now the reason why I'm bringing this question up is because yet again the studio series Devastator has a flaw. And that flaw would be for Rampage to beat a whole leg. While in reality, he should just beat a foot. So to fix this issue, let's jump right back into the Devastator combination scene. And on the top of the mountain, we can see Skipjack and Payload. Now this is important because we can clearly see Skipjack and Payload together, which implies that they transform into each other. And this is further proven by the fact that if you look at their vehicle mode, and I'm using Rampages and Long Hauls as a reference, Payload is much bigger than Skipjack, proving that Skipjack could not pull off being the leg alone. And if you look at Payload's vehicle mode compared to Long Hauls, they are essentially the same dump truck, with a few aesthetic changes, which explains why both legs are the same size. And since Skipjack would just be the foot, the extra parts would just have to find a new place to go, to still be the same size. And this is exactly what we see in Devastator's robot mode, even to the point that if you look at the connection ports, Long Hauls and Payloads are nearly identical, but there's one glaring flaw that I didn't point out. That being the extra third tread, along with the fact that there's no sign of Payload's tigers anywhere. And we can't just say that the extra third tread magically came out of Skipjack, since we clearly see the only two ones that he has right in front of us. Well the answer to this is going to be a bit of a stretch, but it's the best case scenario on why this third tread is here. So I believe when Skipjack and Payload combine, Payload's back tires get hidden, while his front tires combine and stretch out to mimic Skipjack's tread. But now you may be saying trance. Transformers can't alter how the rubber rearranges? Well this is actually not the case, since if you remember of Optimus Prime, he can split his rubber tires to make them have a crease in them. This is also shown to a more extreme extent with Demolisher, and how he can make his treads into a circular shape. And like I said before, it's a bit of a stretch, but what else can we base this off of? The next misconception on this list that's probably going to demonetize this video is, where does Devastator's Wrecking Balls come from? Or as Simmons calls them, 
enemy scrotum. Now this was mainly implemented as some bay humor, but now let's take an in-universe look on why they're there. Well, to first answer this question, we gotta know what are these wrecking balls used for? And they are actually not wrecking balls at all, but they're overhaul balls. And what these overhaul balls are used for is to add weight to a crane rope so the crane rope can stay tight. This prevents the wind from twisting the crane rope, which could ultimately create permanent damage to the crane. And to further prove that these are not wrecking balls, wrecking balls don't have a hook. And wrecking balls are a physical ball that can be used from all sides to break down a wall or structure, concluding these balls are still to be overhaul balls. But now we need to ask ourselves what constructor con is responsible for having these. Well, this job would most definitely fit Hightower's role, since he is a crane. But if we take a look at his vehicle mode, the balls aren't there. So the next best option would be Overload, since he becomes a lower torso. And that's where Devastator's balls of steel are located. But this makes no sense since Overload is in a crane, so why would he have them in the first place? Well, the best way to explain why he has them is this. Due to his size in vehicle mode, he could easily store them in a storage compartment. But in robot mode, he could choose to use them as a weapon. This can explain why one of the balls is missing its hook. The next question that we need to solve is why does Devastator have a red face, when Mixmaster does not have any red on him whatsoever. Well, the answer to this is probably going to shock you, so bear with me. Mixmaster indeed does make the head of Devastator, creating the neck and vortex drum, but not the face, since the face gets housed in Scavenger. And if you don't believe me, take a look at Devastator's face. He has a lot of red on it, but he also has a lot of white sprinkled throughout. And if you look at Scavenger's color palette, this would definitely fit the bill. But to put the last nail in the coffin, when Devastator's face does appear, it appears to be shoved out of Mixmaster's front cab. And since Scavenger is directly behind Mixmaster, I can conclude that some of Scavenger's parts go through Mixmaster to form up the face. And if this explanation doesn't satisfy you, take a look at Mixmaster's grill. It starts way in the front and then later moves up at the back. So I believe this whole face shoving through Mixmaster is not that far of a stretch. The next misconception I'd like to take a look at and is by far the most confusing one would be the Constructicon drones. Now we saw three Constructicon drones, the Mixmaster, Scrapper, and Long Haul one. And two of them pop back up in Dark of the Moon, but I'll cover that in a bit. But back onto the clones, the reason why people are confused with them is that they are exact copies of the original Mixmaster, Scrapper, and Long Haul. And this brings up a few questions. If the original Mixmaster dies, can this clone just jump right in and save the day? Well, I have to say no to this and here is why. The Constructicon clones only spoke in Cybertronian, and never in English. Unlike the Molisher and Rampage who did speak English. This is why I consider Grinder not to be a clone of Blackout, since he actually speaks. And if you listen closely, he says no prime please. <laughs> And this case also works for Bone Crusher since in Transformers 1 he says, I hate you. But in Revenge of the Fallen, he had no speaking role whatsoever, leading most people to believe that he's just a clone. But for me, since Bone Crusher didn't speak in Revenge of the Fallen, he gets a pass of being the original Bone Crusher, since there's no other conflicting evidence to prove that he isn't. And if you want to know more about Bone Crusher being in Revenge of the Fallen, please take a look at my Bone Crusher video to learn more. But moving back onto the Constructicon clones, another reason why they're just clones is the fact that they're just ripoffs. And like I said before, the reason why the Molster and Rampage don't get classified as clones, they are different colors and or vehicles, and they both spoke in English. And for the Constructicon clones, they did not have any of these qualities. But now we need to figure out why are there Constructicon clones in the first place? Well, the reason why I believe they exist is because they are used for extra artillery. And what I mean here is if you look at Long Haul, he's very beefy and can take a lot of hits. So I believe that the Decepticons would want to clone him for that exact reason. Along with the fact that his body type is a variant of a protoform. Proving by the fact that we can see a protoform that has a body type similar to Long Haul. This also explains why Onslaught uses Long Haul's body type since he had the same protoform structure. But if this confuses you, the Long Haul drone is a physical copy of Long Haul, while the protoforms that we see in later films are variants of the base protoform. But now let's tackle Scrapper. Now the reason why he was cloned was because his body structure would be ideal to fit the bill of a soldier. But they enhance his clone by giving him the ability to use his arm as a wrecking ball. Now the reason I'm saying this is because we never saw the actual Scrapper have this ability. But for the people that believe he already had this ability, then you could go with Theory 2. Which is, since Scrapper already had this ability, it appealed to the Decepticons clone him since his weapon could come in handy to destroy targets and immobilize enemies. So I'll leave it up to you guys to decide which Scrapper clone theory you like the best. But now moving on to our final clone, Mixmaster. Now the reason I like to believe that he was cloned was because he could use his shield ability to defend himself from projectiles. And this would come in handy if they would use Mixmaster's body as a clone. But they would further enhance him, taking away his Devastator head ability and replacing it with a blaster that he could use to shoot targets while at the same time defending himself with his shields. So more or less a protected cannon. And 
like I said before, if you don't like the idea that they re-engineered Mixmaster Drone's body to give him the blaster, then you could just say that due to Mixmaster's ability, they picked him to be the base of this clone since it would help in combat. And another thing that I forgot to mention, the Decepticons took out all combining abilities from the clones since they were going to be potentially mass produced. But the final thing to say about the clones before we move into fun facts is, if the clones have a soul, and what I mean here is, do they have a consciousness? Well the answer to this is no, and here is why. Since they are built with one purpose in mind, I don't think the Decepticons would waste their time and energy to give them a consciousness since they were just made to fight, and they would most likely end up dying on the battlefield. But remember, they're not like protoforms. Since all Transformers start out as protoforms, who can connect to the World Wide Web and learn Earth's languages. And one Decepticon protoform does say something in English, but I'll leave it up to you guys to decipher. Now before we move on to Dark of the Moon, let's talk about some fun facts about Devastator. First of which, when we see Devastator push the top of the pyramid off, his fist is traveling at 390 miles per hour. The next fun fact is that this image here is the earliest Devastator concept art, showing him to be more humanoid. Devastator's full CGI model is made up of 52,632 G-Medic pieces and 11,716,127 polygons. And if you put all these pieces out in a line, the total length would be 13.84 miles. But if you put all of Devastator's texture files into one file, that file would take up 32 gigabytes of computer space. And according to Sean Kelly, the ILM lead animator for Revenge of the Fallen, when loading up Devastator's CGI model in high resolution, it caused computers to break, frying all the internal components, including the motherboard. To work around this, they put each of Devastator's body parts in a separate rig, to make it easier on the computer. Devastator has one steel ball and one brass ball. If Devastator would stand upright, he would be a whopping 103 feet tall. The next fun facts are just going to be on the separate Constructicons. During early production, Mixmaster was originally going to be an Autobot, with a different head that was based off of Brendan Gleeson. And this head would be repurposed for the G1 redeco of Mixmaster. Hightower has two versions of his robot mode, one with a tail, tread feet, and some tiny T-Rex arms, and the other similar to the first, but with bigger arms along with having one of the enemy scrotums as his weapon. And ten years later down the road, Studio Series would use Concept Art 1 as Hightower's official robot mode. Longhall's robot mode was originally a fan art created by the talented concept artist Josh Nizai, which he would use to attract the attention of Hasbro's design director, Aaron Attinger, and director Michael Bay. Nizzy's work impressed Hasbro and a director enough for him to be hired as a concept artist and for his longhaul design to actually be used for the character in the movie, along with associated media and merchandise. Longhaul's design by Josh was the very first design approved for Revenge of the Fallen. Longhaul's design in the concept art was based off of a Cat 797, but since the vehicle was so big, they had to scale him down into a Cat 773B. This is why all of Longhaul's toys in Revenge of the Fallen had an inaccurate vehicle form. Another inaccuracy in the film was Longhaul's number. It says L250, leading most people to believe that he was an L250 dump truck, but in reality he's a 773B. Scavenger actually has a fully modeled CGI render, but it was never used in Revenge of the Fallen, and was most likely repurposed to be used as Demolisher. Overload has three robot form concept arts, one that looks like a spider, one that's a biped version of the spider look, and the other has the same biped look, but then with this weird hook weapon on top of him. Only time will tell which version Hasbro will pick for the Studio Series Overload, but the Legends class toy, along with the Revenge of the Fallen books, did use the hook versions as Overload's definitive robot mode. Rampage's early concept art depicted him as a Tesmic M5 mechanical trencher. If Buckethead would transform into robot mode, his robot mode would be a combination of Scrapper and Skipjack. And that's all the interesting fun facts that I found about Devastator. But we're not done yet, since in Transformers Dark of the Moon, we see Long Haul and Scrapper. But how can this be possible if we saw Devastator die in Revenge of the Fallen? Well, if we take a look at Devastator's death, some of the Constructicons actually survived the blast. Since Scavenger got shot right in the connection port, where Scrapper combines onto, it sent Scrapper on a wild ride into the air. And since Scrapper did not get shot by the blast, I would say he would survive since the only damage he would take would be hitting the ground. And since the severed connection port takes the heat of the damage during the fall, this would cause Scrapper to survive the fall and return into Dark of the Moon. The next constructor cons that would survive would be Skipjack, Payload, and Long Haul, since they wouldn't get ripped off during the fall. And as we see while rolling down the pyramid, they don't get crushed by Devastator's weight. And they roll perfectly down the pyramid until Devastator's back would hit a wall of sandstone. And due to this impact, it would kill Overload right on the spot. And then along with Mixmaster since it gets ripped off clean. And since Mixmaster doesn't have the other half of his body, he would die due to energon loss. Along with Scavenger, since Scavenger lost basically both of his arms, which formed the connection ports. But for Hightower and Buckethead, they would survive since when Devastator slams his hand into the pyramid, Buckethead gets stuck into the bricks. And Devastator 
later tries to use this to his advantage to stay onto the pyramid, but due to his weight he would fall backwards down the pyramid, leaving both Buckethead and Hightower alive. But Scrap Metal wouldn't be so lucky, since he was in the middle of it all, and got ripped right in half, proven by the fact that we can see Scrap Metal's combined mode right here. But now you may ask what happened to the dead body parts of Devastator, why well, I believe that they were taken in nest to be disposed of, and for the ones that survived, I believe that they went into hiding shortly after Revenge of the Fallen. But now let's move on to Dark of the Moon, and in Dark of the Moon we see Scrapper and Long Haul in the background. Now you could say they are just Constructicon clones, but I would have to disagree, since we never saw any of the Constructicon clones being mass produced, and it only looked like there was only one set ever made of them, with potential in the future to create more. But since we saw them all die in Operation Firestorm, there is no way to prove that they are Constructicon clones. And to further back this point up, we saw Scrapper and Long Haul survive Revenge of the Fallen, but only Scrapper would survive Dark of the Moon, and Long Haul would fall by the hands of Optimus Prime, since he was shot directly square in the chest, causing him to explode. But Scrapper wouldn't get a quick and easy death like his comrade, he would be shanked through the gut and slashed at the back of the spine, causing him to fall down on a mine. But through all this pain, he would survive to tell the tale. But now we need to ask ourselves, where's Buckethead, Hightower, and Payload during all this? Well, I believe during the events between Revenge of the Fallen and Dark of the Moon, Hightower was hunted down by Nest, and they mainly found him due to his size, just like Demolisher. And as for Buckethead and Payload, they would survive throughout Dark of the Moon by bailing once word got out that Megatron was killed. During the events of Age of Extinction, I believe that Buckethead and Skipjack were hunted down, since there's no mention or reference of them anywhere, similar to how Sideswap and Dino were never mentioned ever again. And with this in mind, we have to accept the unpopular opinion that they're all deceased. But now you may be wondering, why did I not list Payload and Scrapper as deceased? Well, my reasoning for this is, we actually see them both again in Transformers The Last Night. So let's start off with Trench. Now the real world reason why Trench was included in The Last Night was because it celebrates the relationship between Transformers and Caterpillar construction. Since a lot of the Caterpillar machines were featured as Constructicons in Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. And it looks like we've come full circle, since Trench has the same bot mode as Scrapper, but his vehicle mode is a Cat 320 Excavator. But we can't just confirm him to be Scrapper, since didn't Scrapper die at the end of Dark of the Moon? Well, remember when I said that he would be able to tell his tale of his near-death experience? Well, due to his injuries that he would sustain, this would cause his lower torso to fall off, leaving Scrapper to crawl out of the battlefield, with the added task of the Autobots not spotting him. And it's a miracle that he even pulled this off. But the reason why I say Scrapper would become Trench is because of two reasons. They share the same body type, and that Trench has no canon media of his origin, along with Scrapper's fate being unknown at the end of Dark of the Moon. But there's one big thing that debunks this theory, and that would be the size of Scrapper and Trench. If you remember, Scrapper's cannon height is 29 feet, and Trench is 10 feet shorter at that at 19. So if Scrapper is Trench, how can this be? Well, if you remember, he had to crawl out of the battlefield since he lost his legs. Now, Transformers can't regrow limbs, so for Scrapper to get legs again, he would have to find a new pair of legs. And since there are a lot of dead protoform carcasses around, he would easily be able to find a new pair of legs, but they wouldn't be the same size as his originals. But now you may be saying Trance. How could Scrapper just slap on some new legs and walk away? Well, if you remember, this actually has been done before. If you look at Transformers the last night once again, Squeaks loses his arm and is replaced later on by a Decepticon arm. Thanks to the help of Izzy. And if you note, this arm is from a completely different body, but yet it's still compatible with Squeaks to use. And if you'd like to have an original trilogy example, take a look at Starscream. In the forest battle, Prime chops Starscream's arm off, but later he's able to put it back on. And I believe that we can use an analogy for why Scrapper is so much smaller when he's Trench. But the next thing for Scrapper that we need to figure out is, how do he survive without his lower torso? Well, this is not the first time a Transformer has survived without their torso. And granted, they can only survive for a limited amount of time. Take the Mixmaster clone, for example. He was moving all fine and well when Jetfire chopped him. And this analogy also happened with Jazz, since if you remember, Ironhide says we couldn't save him. More or less meaning that Jazz didn't die from the initial split, but due to his energon loss, since we can see his spinal cord. And this somewhat also is shown for Mixmaster, but due to the dust in the scene, it makes it hard to see. But there's one other fact that I did not talk about yet, and that is cauterization, which is a medical procedure or technique of burning a part of the body to close off a wound. And this is seen with Brawl in Mission City. The reason why he doesn't leak out energon over the place was due to how hot Bumblebee's plasma shots were. It cauterized most of his wounds, letting him last longer in battle. But the reason why this didn't happen with Jazz was because there was no heat involved, leaving him to bleed out. So with all this evidence on the table, I hope it paints a picture on how a Cybertronian can reattach limbs even if they're not theirs, and that they can survive for a limited amount of time without a torso. But the next question that we have to ask is why would Scrapper join the Autobots? Well, after Dark of the Moon, the Decepticon faction was in shambles. With their leaders gone, and big players such as Starscream, Shockwave, and Soundwave out of the picture, 
there was no hope for them to grow as strong as they used to be. This would cause many Decepticons to go into hiding, and most be killed off by Cemetery Wind. During this time in hiding, Scrapper scanned his new Cab 320 vehicle mode as a disguise. Later on, Scrapper was fortunate enough to be discovered by Cade Yeager on one of his Transformer hunts, in which he would switch his name to Trench to leave his Decepticon heritage behind, and to become an official member of the Autobot team. As the old saying goes, if you can't beat him, join him. Now the second to last thing I want to cover on Trench, before we move on to Canopy is, can Trench be considered a reprogrammed Scrapper drone? Well, to this answer, I would have to say no, since there was only one Scrapper drone ever made, and that drone was blown up in Operation Firestorm with all the other Constructicon clones. But to leave the Trench discussion on a final note, I found it interesting that his leg still has a tire in it, but this just could be overlooked as the treads going into a circular shape, just like Demolisher. And if you're wondering why Trench has similar legs back, it's because once he would scan his new vehicle form, it would give him new parts to accommodate his new mode, but it would also stick to his robot mode design, concluding why Trench has almost identical legs to when he was Scrapper. But the last question that we need to ask ourselves is, what happened to him? Well, the last time that we ever see him was in a junkyard, right before Megatron and the gang would attack. As we saw Hound get shot, it goes to a cut of the Autobots driving away. But I believe during this time, Trench would try to fight off one of the crew members, but he would ultimately be overpowered. And if one of the members realizing that Trench was a former Decepticon, they would take him to Megatron, where Megatron would personally execute him for being a traitor. And that would be the end of Scrapper's story for the rest of the former Transformer cinematic universe. But now let's move on to our last point of discussion, Canopy. And just like with Scrapper, Payload would fall into the same circumstance, for him to flee after the Battle of Chicago and go into hiding. But he would end up going back into Chicago to search for any survivors, but instead he would find a little girl named Izzy, and would realize all the bad things that Decepticons have done. And moved by her story, he would become an Autobot that stopped Decepticons from committing crimes against humanity. And during his time spent with her, they would find a broken Transformer named Squeaks, who got damaged due to the Battle of Chicago, and was left for dead. Canopy would teach Izzy how to fix up a Transformer, and this is why we can see Izzy being an expert on fixing Transformers. But for when it was time for Canopy to bite the dust, he was shot by a TRF missile. And right before he died, he told Izzy, I want to thank you. And what I believe this line means, is Canopy thanking Izzy for changing his perspective on humanity, but there are a few things that I would like to cover of Canopy, with one being what is his vehicle form. If you look at Canopy, he's not his old dump truck form anymore, since he doesn't have the arm shields anymore, but he does have some warning panels on his thighs. But here's the thing. I don't think he even has a vehicle mode anymore, and here is why. We can clearly see that he did have a vehicle mode at one point. We don't know exactly what it was, but it wasn't his old 773B dump truck. But the reason why I say he doesn't anymore is because we saw him very damaged and beaten up, and there was no evidence of treads or tires on him whatsoever. And the reason for this is, we saw Izzy use Energon to cause one of the TRF sentries to go down, and Squeaks used the cables to make it fall. But how would they know how to do this if they never came in contact with the TRF before? I believe that Canopy got damaged in the first ever run with the TRF. I speculate that he lost any tires that would have been on his back, and he tried to use his arm shields as much as he could, but the TRF sentry bullets would eventually break through, destroying his shields and causing him to evacuate. And there was only so much Izzy could do to fix up Canopy, and it's not like it's easy to find another construction tire to replace, since once his was destroyed, there was no hope in getting a new one. But this all comes full circle, because Canopy hides wearing a trench coat made out of rubble, that he would use to hide in plain sight, and if he still had his vehicle mode available to him, I believe that he would have transformed and took Izzy and the kids to safety, when the TRF was after them. The second thing I'd like to cover with Canopy is his size. Now if you remember, when he was payload, he was 30 feet tall, but his Canopy, he's listed as 20 feet tall. So where did this 10 feet drop come from? Well, we don't know what happened to him during the events between Dark of the Moon and TLK, so he could have a similar fate to Scrapper by getting his legs chopped off. But for what I think would be the best example, would be a similar case to Scrapper's, but payload will get it far worse, from being damaged all over his body and left for dead. And what I mean here is, he was barely clinging on to dear life due to how badly damaged he was. And once he collected some scrap parts to fix himself to an extent, he would scan his new vehicle mode. And since it was smaller, it would physically shrink him down due to how many parts he lost. So what I mean here is, his broken body accommodated enough space for the smaller vehicle. But if he was still at full size, he would not have been able to scan it. And because he scanned it in his broken state, once he would transform into bot mode, he would be a slightly smaller version of himself. The next and final thing I would like to cover is why does Canopy and Trench have new heads? Now, though they're similar to their originals, they do differ drastically, with Trench's head being more friendly by losing two sets of the three teeth, and for Canopy to give himself a more humanoid mouth and jawline. And the very last thing I would like to say before I go is a fun fact on Canopy. Canopy was originally going to be a subway train robot with all this junk on him, similar to Day Trader. And I think it would have been cool to see this design 
in the film, but due to how little screen time Canopy would end up getting, it wouldn't be worth creating a whole new CGI model just for a character who was going to die early on. And just like that, that was Devastator Misconceptions 2.0. If you enjoyed this theory in the Fixing Transformers collection, please give a like rating because it helped the channel a lot. I would also appreciate it if you would share this video since this video took me a tremendous amount of time to script, edit, and research. So if you do so, you are an amazing human being. And as always in any Trans Theories video, this has been Trans Theories reminding you guys to never stop theorizing.